Susan, a lot of times I'll ask someone, how did you first get introduced to baseball? But I, I know the answer to your question, and I want to hear it. Your grandfather used to take mm -hmm. you to games. How old were you? I was three when I first went. You don't, you don't remember the game. Everybody says, well, who did you play? I don't know. Maybe the Senators, but I don't remember. But I do remember the feeling. That's what I remember. I remember holding my grandfather's hand, and it's very dark in the hallways at Fenway Park, and I remember going up the ramp and out into the sunshine and there was this little I thought I was in a little green velvet jewelry box and I just looked around and there was something about it and I know I was little I know I was really little but there was something musical and beautiful and symmetrical I didn't know that word when I was three but I know it now there was just something about it and I was fascinated by the whole thing I just loved every second of it just being there that attraction to baseball has remained with you now on a day like this, you come to a random game at Yankee Stadium. Do you allow yourself a second to think back to your grandfather and that he got this all started? All the time. And I'm very aware when I'm on the radio, he never got to see any of this. I was still in theater when, when he died. And gosh, he would love this. He wouldn't believe it. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting because um, way back then, I didn't know as a little girl I wasn't supposed to like baseball and I wasn't supposed to know. My mother knew, my aunts knew, as I've told you before, Cardinal Cushing brought the nuns, they knew every Wednesday afternoon. Um, so it was, it was an interesting dynamic. It was the 50s in Boston and there were women everywhere. And I didn't know that little girls weren't supposed to like baseball, I just loved every second of it. So how did that little girl turn into this accomplished woman who is a pioneer in this business, who is the first full-time broadcaster on a Major League Baseball team. I know there's so many ways you can answer that question, but how did you persevere and how did you get to this point? Well, persevere, that's another story for another time, but um, when I came to New York to do theater, and after all the years that I was in theater, I was getting older and I realized the music was changing. The Broadway musicals that I came to New York to do, they were gone. They weren't coming back. And I'd better find something else to do with my life. I really was that um, adamant about moving ahead. I really anticipate things very, very well. And sports was really the only other thing that I really thought, I know this. What had started at Jack was one, when I was doing Man of La Mancha on the road all over, all over North America, how I would go to the ball games for nothing was to sing the national anthem. I'd call up and I'd say, Hello, I'm Susan Waldman of Man of La Mancha. Do you need an anthem singer? This is the 70s. Nobody sang. Nobody knew it was a way to get on television. I mean, it was not anything anybody did. I just wanted to go to the ball game. And also, when I was starring with Richard Kiley, he didn't like to get up in the morning. So I would go on all the morning shows. Good morning, Pittsburgh. Good morning, Baltimore. Good morning, Miami at 9 o'clock in the morning. And they'd say, well, get the girl and the one that talks about sports. Get her. Because after you, after you sold tickets to Man of La Mancha, they had to talk to you about something. <laughs> and I'd always talk about the sports teams because I found that going to a ball game in another city, you have a family for an afternoon. You know, it's very mm -hmm. lonely touring around. And I would go and I would sit and I would find friends and the accents were different, but you would find a family for an afternoon. And that's how it started. And um, actually, Ken Coleman, who was the longtime voice of the Boston Red Sox, said, I have this friend of mine. They're starting this new thing, uh, WFAN uh, radio. This is 1986. And he said, you know, you, you got to meet him go make a tape. And I said, what's that? <laughs> and so they showed me what to do. And I brought it in and got hired for um, updates. God, I was awful. Uh, but <laughs> that was, once I got that job, I found out that walking in the door, um, I was hated because I was female and I never understood it. And then it became something else. Then it mm. became, you're not going to tell me I can't do this. I know as much as you do. And I know as much as you do. And you know, and there isn't an 18-year-old intern that doesn't think that they know more than, than I. They don't, but they do, they do think that. I don't think that's changed either. But You were the first voice mm -hmm. ever heard on WFAN. Yes. You worked your way up through WFAN, obviously doing what you do now. How has it been difficult? How have people been kind to you? How have people not been so kind to you? Because you've mentioned there are people who wouldn't talk to you in the press box. I know there's a famous uh, George Bell, Jesse Barfield story. Yeah. We, we could talk about this for days, well, never mind yeah. hours, but what were the things that just kept you focused? I think it's because I thought I had something to, to contribute. To, I don't see the game the same way. It has nothing to do with my being a female. I am female, so I look at things, but I, I think 
any idiot can tell you slider down and away and what it is. Why did he throw it? Why did he miss? What's going on? Um, what's going on with them? And I, I thought the humanity was being taken out of the game. And now it's gone to a whole new level of the humanity being taken out of the game. But I, that's what I wanted to impart. I wanted to show fans out there that these are people. These are really people. So you root for people, not for their stats, because of what they are. And maybe they're going through something. And baseball is very peculiar because there isn't anyone who doesn't think, you know, if I hadn't had to go work in my father's bank, I could have done that. Not, not football, not basketball, you know you can't do that. But everybody thinks they can play baseball. And so there's a failure thing that happens a lot, and that's why I think fans get angry. Also, I was a performer for a very long time, and I know what it's like to fail in front of thousands and thousands of people. The same thing that drove me to a Broadway stage is the same thing that puts a bat in Alex Rodriguez's hand. Different stage. Um, same person. So I thought maybe I had a little more insight and I could bring something else to other people. I, I didn't know people didn't want that, but, but now, now they sort of do. That last part that you said about being a performer is very interesting to me. Have you ever been able to tell, and I'm sure you have, an interview with someone where they got it that you got it, that you understood what it was like to, to fail, as you just said? Well. I know that when I first started in this game, I used to make sure that I sang the anthem at least once a year so that they would know who was standing out there. Now I don't have to. Now people know. But yeah, they do. And um, I do know that people answer me differently than guys when I'm by myself. If you went over to Alex Rodriguez and said, why'd you swing at that? He'd probably say to you, why, what would you have done? <laughs> if I ask him, why'd you swing at that? He'll answer me because I'm not competing with him. I'm not a guy that's sitting there and saying, I was a good ball player. I could have done that. This is your dumb. And it's a, a different dynamic. And I think, and it was very important for me to do that. I, if you think back in the old stadium, at least once a year, I was out there on that field. So everyone knew. Do you have moments in your career that make you the most proud? That when you think back of something that you've accomplished, that you say, I'm really proud of what I did then. Sure. And what are they? Um, George and Yogi obviously, getting those two together. Um, the and we should talk about that, by okay. the way. George Steinbrenner and Yogi Berra, 14 years, 14 right? 14 years. There was a 14-year... Gap. They never talked they to never each talked other. They never talked to each How other. Never How did you help get those two Yankee icons back together? Um, WFAN, the, the program director, had called Yogi was going to open his museum. Now, I had never met Yogi. I didn't know Yogi. I met him once at, at Mel Allen's funeral. But I, I didn't know Yogi. My allegiance was to George, who helped me monumentally. So Mark Chernoff, the program director of WFAN, calls and said, you're going to do six to nine at this new museum, um, Yogi Berra Museum. We're going to have the 73 Mets there. And wouldn't it be great if you got George and Yogi to make up on the air? I said, sure. So I was talking to George about a week ago, a week afterwards, and I said, George, I want to ask you something about Yogi. And he said, what's wrong? And as soon as he said, what's wrong, I went for it. And I said, I, I think you guys should make up. And I told him what I wanted. And he said, well, we'll do it during the season. I said, no, no, no. You have to do it, and you have to go there. And he said, well, I'll, I'll think about it. Hangs up. So I was going back and forth with Dale Berra. And to see, because I never talked to Yogi, and Yogi never talked to George. And George and I would decide things, and then we'd call them, and it was back and forth. The thing was, we were not allowed to tell anybody. Mm. And because this might not have worked, and then I'd be stuck talking with the 73 Mets for three hours, which would have been a total disaster. And we were going to do it one day, and then the governor of Florida died. And mm. George was a friend of his, and he said, I, I can't go. I'll call Yogi and explain. And so I said, this is going to work, because in his mind, he had already apologized. And he would say things to me like, well, what does he want? What does he want me to apologize for? And I said, I don't know, George. You did it. What? He said, well, I don't know. I don't know if we can do this. And it went back. He actually had people time how long it would take for his plane to get to Teterboro and how long it would take for him to go to the museum when the plane landed at Teterboro. It was remarkable. And then the day worked. I had everything all set up just in case it worked. I had Ted Williams call in. We called Ted Williams. We called Joe Garagiola. We had Bill White. We had everybody on for that first hour. And it was wow. tremendous. That was my, my thank you to George. And I remember when they had Yogi Day, remember that day? And then the, no, the, the perfect game? 
uh, I was standing in the dugout and Yogi came in and people were standing and sharing and screaming and I was like had tears down my eyes and I kept saying to myself I did that I did that the other thing very different my career was started because of the San Francisco earthquake That's because right. for some reason my phone in that place didn't go out and I was on live through the whole thing and you continued to report on what was happening around you and, and remained steady during a time where people were panicking. Well, I don't know how steady I was. Don <laughs> Imus has a clip of it he says, I've not, where I said, I've never been so scared in my whole entire life. But you reported I, on the moment, so I that's did. emotion. That's I giving did. people what was happening. I did, and um, I was on all, all night, too. I, we got back to the hotel. Um, people took us three hours to find. I was all by myself. I didn't know anybody, and I was found by... Um, Ira Brokaw of the New York Times and Henry Hecht of Newsday. Henry found me on the field wandering around afterwards and he said, we've got a car. And it took us like three hours to get back wow. to San Francisco. And then I was on the air and I, rem I do remember one thing. When we got back to the hotel, there were no lights, but there was a phone. And I was on with Steve Summers overnight. And I remember saying, I want everybody to know we're all okay. I mean, Bill Madden was there, Marty. No, everyone was there, but I had seen everybody and people couldn't get to the reporters. And uh, they were all at the St. Francis going into the mini bars, I think. But I remember saying, we're all okay. Don't worry about anybody. If you want to call, call in and ask them, and I'll, I'll tell you whether I've seen them or not. And I stayed there and did city side stuff, and, and it was remarkable. Now, I think that's the first time anybody ever took me seriously. As you work with John Sterling on a daily basis, and, and I've seen the way you work. You're here every day. You're here early. You're doing your own interviews. Which, by the way, would be my advice to, to some new journalist who just follow the group of people. Don't travel in a pack, yeah, do your, ever. Do ever. your own interviews. Well, let, 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 let me close out the interview by asking you that. You must get asked by so many young people, mm -hmm. especially female people, how do I get to do what you do? How can I get in the business? What, what do you tell them? Well, first of all, when somebody says to me, um, I want to be you, um, I, I say, well, there already is a me, and I'm not going anywhere. And if you're a female, I want you to understand what I'm saying. If you t don't get my job, make your own job. Mm -hmm. If you take my job, there's still just one of us. If you make your own job, there's two of you. And there's, don't be somebody else. There already is that person. And, you know, like I keep, uh, my, one of my best friends is Leslie Visser. I mean, she's been doing this forever. She's in the Football Hall of Fame. How can I be you? They said to Leslie. Leslie says, don't be me. There already is a me, and I'm not going anywhere. And don't let people tell you no. If you've got something to contribute, make sure it's different. If you've got something that is different from somebody else that you can contribute to this business, don't let anybody stop you. Mm -hmm. There are ways to do that. Um, when people used to ask me, though, in theater, how do you get into theater? Um, I've heard this from actresses for the last 50 years. If you have to ask somebody, do something else. It's a great, great it's, answer. It's, yeah. very t it's very tough. If you've ever thought of being a fireman, you know, be being in a rodeo, anything else, if, that, if you've thought, well, maybe I could do that, then do that because this is very, this is very, very tough. So my mother always said to me, um, you pick the only thing that could be harder than being on Broadway, and that's being a woman in sports. <laughs> she was and, right. <laughs> she was right. And you've excelled at both. Now, you said don't let anyone ever say no to you. Okay. I'm not letting you say no to me. This is a part of the JCTV show. We open okay. a pack of baseball cards. They don't put them in their bicycle spokes anymore, right? No, they don't. And there's no gum. <laughs> okay. Oh, Whoever has the best card gets to keep both cards. We're going to debate. So if, okay. I, if I get a Mike Trout and you get a Bryce Harper, we might have a little debate. And by the way, they're 2016 cards, but they're made to look like 1967, interestingly enough. Oh, best year of my little, life. A little heritage uh, action here. I got Aaron Sanchez. Pat Vendetti just sent down, I got two Blue Jays to start off. Cole Calhoun, Adam Eaton. I've got Michael Pineda, Melky Cabrera, Colton Wong. I do not oh. have an MVP type in I my pack. I don't either. No, I don't. I have... Who would be um, your best? J.D. Martinez so far. I have Will Myers, John Danks. He was released. That's no good. Martin Prado. He's okay. Justin Moore. No, he's not playing yet, right? He's still hurt? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mike Aviles, who's a wonderful man. These are not great packs, Susan, so we're both going to keep our own. Okay, but I want to make a case for J.D. Martinez. Let's see. No, but it, but it's people. Remember, two seventy-five, five thirty-three. So look you think J.D. Martinez gives you my whole pack? 
Um, well, let me tell you why, because okay. it goes into what we're talking about, about stats. You're looking at stats. I'm looking at J.D. Martinez, who was flat out released by the Houston Astros Very true. because he wasn't good. And all of a sudden, Dave Dombrowski gets him within three days, and all of a sudden, he's th hitting 35, 40 home runs every year. And has made a nice career for himself. Yes, he has. You've made a convincing argument. Okay. You win. Thank you. And I, I don't have a bicycle anymore. I put them in my spokes. Susan wins again. Susan, <laughs> thanks so much for joining thanks me. Thanks for having me. I appreciate me, it.